I'm no wargamer, so it's not often that I'm painting large armies of similar looking minis, but even so, as a dungeon master, every so often an encounter or an adventure will call for a large number of similar minis, so even I can find myself batch painting a large number of models. This is especially true at the tier 1 levels of D&D play, where your low level parties are often dealing with large numbers of very weak enemies. Things like kobolds, gnolls, undead, or in today's case, goblins. I've been eyeing Kings of War by Mantic Games for a while. A lot of the range looks like it would work really great for D&D. You could easily create legions of the Hells from their Abyss Forces set, or swaths of skeletons from their undead armies. And they have a bunch of great looking ogres, giants, elementals across the range, as well as a bunch of unique characters that would be super easy to homebrew stat blocks for. And having spotted a Goblin Regiment box, 20 models for 40 bucks, <laughs> I snagged that straight away. And to my surprise, not only does it have the 20 goblins it mentioned, but also four really cool wolves or dogs that weren't even listed on my local website. And because this kit is for a war game, there are enough bits in this box to make each of the goblins with any of the weapon combinations. Sword and shield, sword and spear, or bow and arrow with a quiver. And all those extra parts will be so good to have in my bits box. I'm sure I'll chew through these quivers in no time. In assembling these models, I noticed the plastic was slightly darker in colour than a Games Workshop or Archon Studios kit, and was a little bit harder of a plastic. It still reacts and works with plastic cement, so it didn't make much of a difference to the process, aside from a little more force being required for cleanup. Not a negative or a positive, just an observation I thought was interesting. Today I'm building the first 10 of these goblins, and I'll be building them up as melee fighters, trying to give some specific character to a few of the models. Creating a rogue using the dagger, face covering, and a light shield. A berserker with a crude weapon and shield and a full plate headpiece covering his eyes that made him look absolutely feral. And a goblin boss using a regal looking helm and one of the more interesting looking blades that could potentially be flavoured as magical in D&D. There are a few parts that I noticed in this kit where mold lines are a little more noticeable than others, and even one or two tiny details where it doesn't look like the plastic has perfectly filled the mold. I'm not sure if this has anything to do with the harder plastics or not, but it is an observation I made with my sprues, at the very least. But overall, these models are clean, and the sculpts are wonderful. These guys have so much character, and at just a buck or two when you break it down per model for these characterful plastic minis, I mean, if I'm looking to paint up infantry for D&D, I'll take these over a GW kit or a WizKids mini any day. With these guys assembled, I moved on to priming. I know I want to be able to batch paint these models in a couple of quick sittings, so I'll set these guys up with the option for using speed paints. I won't be relying on speed paints for the whole process, but for some of the less focal areas, it will be nice to have the option. A primer of flat grey from Rust-Oleum, followed by a dry brush of white, my go-to setup for speed paint. I'm hoping to give these guys a similar paint job to an ogre that I recently painted. I'm thinking that a few tones of brown with some selective red features will help to pull these minis together and look like they have some semblance of society. Plus, a brown and red speed paint will be a really nice contrast against the more vibrant layering of the green skin tones that I'll be doing later. I went through and picked out all the clothing with one of three colours. Hardened leather, satchel brown, or blood red from the speed paint's range. I made sure to keep the red accent subtle on these models, so that when I made the goblin boss primarily red, he would stand out among the crowd. He got a full red cloak, whereas most of the others just got a smaller detail in red, such as a tassel, a headpiece, or a loincloth. I then went through and picked out all of the metallic areas with a plate mail metal, which was bright, but I knew I wanted to come in with a wash and some weathering later, so I don't mind if it felt too clean for a pack of goblins. The goblin boss, however, got some weapon bronze for his helmet, to help him stand out even further amongst the crowd. Perhaps this helmet is something of a symbol of power that's passed down from chief to chief over the generations in this tribe. At this point, you'll probably notice that I also coated all of the skin tone areas in the same satchel brown. Now, this wasn't because I wanted to work up from the brown as a shadow tone, but more simply, I didn't want to accidentally miss a spot when I got to my greens, and notice in two months' time that there was a spot of grey on one of the goblin's arms hiding under a shield. By coating them all over with brown, I ensure that the whole model at least has colour on it. That way, if I miss an arm or a hand, it just looks like he has a full sleeve or he's wearing a glove. And it means I don't have to worry too much about hitting any really hard to reach areas with skin tones. Next up, a quick black wash goes over the metals to dull them down and dial back the high sheen of these bright metallics. 
and before doing anything else, I let these models dry overnight, giving them enough time for the speed paints to dry and cure, and the wash to do its job. The next day I start off with an airbrush of matte varnish. This does two things. Firstly, it protects the paint job we've already done, meaning that if I manage to get layer paints on an already painted area in the next steps, it's much easier to clean off without damaging the paint job underneath. And secondly, it dials down the satin, almost full gloss look that speed paints can sometimes leave, bringing this model down to at the very least a satin or maybe matte finish, which is much more in line with where I want these models to be sitting. Having completed 80% of the paint job on these models in a 1-2 to two hour sitting with speed paints, I knew I wanted to take almost that much time again on the more important details with my regular acrylic paints. I wanted to focus on the skin and metallics here, to draw attention to these details, as they are easily the most interesting parts of these models. I mean, just look at this little guy. Starting out, this means picking out some colours for our skin tones. I'm going with a shadow colour of this rich angel green, then I'll move up to a midtone of pure green skin, and my highlight will be a 50-50 mix of our green skin midtone mixed with rainforest green. I then began the batch painting process once again, model by model, picking out the areas of exposed skin with our darker skin tone colour, the angel green, thinning it down enough as to not build texture while keeping enough pigment in our paint as to only have to do one coat. These new Army Painter Fanatics paints are amazing. You can thin them down enough to work with and still get great coverage with a single coat. This is especially true if you're working over a primer or a base coat that works well with your colour. And green over brown is perfect for this, allowing full coverage in just one pass. Which is something that I've found is absolutely key when you're trying to keep batch painting interesting over a bunch of models. I really don't think there'd be much worse than spending half an hour batch painting your army with their base skin tone only to have to do it again to get full coverage. Of course, with some colours or specific paints, this is necessary, it's unavoidable, but where I can avoid it, I absolutely will. And with just the shadow colours in, these guys are already looking pretty good. While their skin doesn't stand out by any means, the colours are all playing nicely, so now it's time to come in and start adding our midtones and highlights. For my midtones, I'm aiming to cover 60-70% to of the shadows picking out all of our top facing areas or raised details. The noses, the tops and edges of the ears, cheekbones and fingers all got a generous coverage with our midtone, leaving our initial angel green just in the shadowed or recessed areas of the model. And even with just our midtone down on the skin, it's already the most punchy part of the model. While our speed paints give great depth, providing a smooth transition from shadow to highlight on the rest of the details of the model, a layer paint allows us to bring more saturation to our shadows and more contrast between our shadow tones, midtones, and highlights. So while no detail on these models is a flat colour, we can use these different mediums to our advantage. Speed paints make quick work of the less important details, giving them a great range of tone but leaving us with enough room to really kick up the colours and the brightness on the key areas like our skin here. Now we're going to come in and pick out maybe 20-25% to of the skin with our highlight colour, our 50-50 mix of green skin and rainforest green. By adding small points of interest to individual muscles, adding more depth to the eyes, and highlighting the noses and ears, we can begin to see just how much of our attention is now being drawn to these focal points of our model, directing our focus to the characterful faces of these minis. While I go through and pick out the rest of these highlights, now feels like a good time to mention that if you're enjoying this video, let YouTube know by hitting like down below. And if you're keen to see more of my hobbying in the future, from 3D printing to miniature painting, hit subscribe to stay in the loop. I have a bunch of really cool projects in the works that include some of my longest paint jobs and easily some of the best minis I've ever painted. With our skin tones complete, it's time to turn our attention back to the weapons and metallics across this clan. The previously washed plate mail metal gets a dry brush of the same metallic silver, to bring back the glittery sheen on the edges and further accentuate the wash that's gathered in the recesses. This includes the boss's helmet. By dry brushing the bronze with a silver, we get a more noticeable shine to the finished result. But I don't stop here. These are ragtag goblins, after all. Many of their weapons would be beaten to hell and poorly maintained, save perhaps for a few, like our goblin boss. But for the vast majority of the clan, I want to add some additional age to their weapons, and it just so happens that my Fnatic Mega Set included a rust effect paint. I've tried this in the past, and the orange of the rust is very opaque, so while the particulates in this paint are a cool start to a rusted look, I knew I needed to be careful with this, and not expect it to look convincing without some work. 
My approach this time round was to thin the paint to somewhere between a layer and a glaze, but to make sure I was still getting some of those particulates in the paint on my brush, and then dotting the slightly thinned mixture onto choice areas of the mini. After I picked out some spots of rust, I went back over each of the models with a clean, old brush, and used a stippling motion with the clean brush to help pick up and spread around some of the paint. This helped to slightly dither the edges of our rust, so it didn't dry in perfect dots of orange, but did so in a patchy way that I think really helps to sell the rusted look. I still have a ways to go in figuring out how to use this paint properly, but I can definitely start to see it coming together, and can really see how this could elevate a paint job, so expect to see it again in the future. These guys were supplied with 20mm square bases, which aren't what I use for D&D. So I based these guys on some 3D printed 25mm bases, covered in various basing supplies that were coated in brown, with a few layers of dry brushing with various browns and greys to give an earthy soil feel. I then came through and applied a patchy layer of PVA to each base before dunking these into my battlefield grass. I like to do a little tap on the bases while they're upside down, to not only get the excess grass off, but also to help some of the grass stand up on end without the use of an applicator. And just like that, these bases were ready for the minis. So after an hour of assembly and maybe three to four hours worth of painting across the minis and the bases, we have 10 goblins finished. And I'm going to be super excited to be putting these on the table in the next few weeks because I think they look awesome. For an average time of 20 minutes per mini, I can't stop looking at these guys. Sure, their clothing is just a layer of speed paint, but those areas are just serving as a backdrop for their facial details and weaponry, and the contrast between those two painting styles makes these minis look all the better in my opinion, especially considering the time they took. But I would love to hear your thoughts. What's your process for painting tens or dozens of minis at a time? Do you use multiple mediums like speed paints and acrylics, or do you just stick to one? And perhaps you think I could have done something differently to improve the quality of the paint job in the same amount of time. Feel free to leave all of your thoughts and recommendations in the comments below. I'll be sure to go through and read as many as I can. Like if you liked, and subscribe to see more of my mini painting in the future. Thank you so much for watching, and as always, have a good one.